Welcome to Church Online. My name is Josh. I'm the lead pastor of Hill City Church. And before we jump into our teaching time today, there's just a few things that I want to highlight for you. First of all, we have a worship playlist on our YouTube page. And there's just an opportunity for us not just to interact with the teaching, but you can actually find the Sunday worship set list in the YouTube description below. And either before you watch the teaching or afterwards, you can queue up those specific songs of worship, including the lyrics, and you can actually worship along with us today. Another way that we worship God is through our giving. At Hill City Church, we believe that we give because God gave. And so we have generous hearts because we have received generosity from God. And so many people in our church have really switched to online giving in this season. And we would invite you, if you want to worship God through investing in His church, in His kingdom, and the work of ministry, then you can find more information about giving at hillcityboise.org slash give. And then the last thing, I would just invite you to fill out one of our online connect cards. Uh, Connect cards are a great way for us as a church to connect with you. You can share your name, your email, just any of your information with us, and we will get you on our email list. It's a great way for us to be able to follow up with you, especially if you're new. But then also, we would love for all of our church to be filling out Connect cards on a regular basis. Uh, You can sign up for a life group. You can sign up for serving. Or maybe even you can write a prayer request. And our pastoral leadership team will pray through all of those prayer requests that come through Connect Cards on a weekly basis. So with all of those things in mind, let's go ahead and jump into our teaching from 1 John. you to think for a moment about a time where you were going somewhere and you got lost along the way. See, the thing is, even if you have a pretty good sense of direction, and I consider myself someone who generally has a good sense of direction, you've probably experienced this before. I think about a time when I was in high school and I was doing a mountain bike race. And, you know, I grew up in Fairbanks, Alaska, which doesn't look at all like Boise, Idaho. And so, you know, here when you're in the foothills and you're on a trail, there's no trees around. So you can see your line of sight of where you're going. But up in Alaska, you're riding through just this thick forest. And I was about eight miles into this mountain bike race when I came across a guy who was walking towards me. And he was walking a bike. It looked like he had had a flat tire. And you know, as I came upon him, he, he stopped me and he said, hey, are you in the mountain bike race? And I was like, yes. And he said, well, bad news. We're about two miles off course right now. Uh, and apparently there was a really sharp corner that both of us had missed. And he got a flat tire. And so you know, I didn't have any patch kit or anything with me. And so I just turned around and I actually ended up not completing that race. I rode back to the starting line and I told them to go send help for this guy. Uh, it reminds me of another time. Last summer, I was running a marathon with my brother in Bend, Oregon. And it's through the Deschutes National Forest. And so once again, just dense forest. And the longer that the race went on, the more tired we both became. And, you know, pretty soon the, the little ribbon markers that they mark the trail with, you know, this, everything starts to blur after a while. And I remember it was about 20 miles into this race, the same thing happened. A guy came running from a different trail to meet us. And he said, hey, are you guys doing the marathon? And we said, yeah. And he's like, well, which way do we go? And we're like, I think we go left right here. And he had gone two miles off course in that race, about 20 miles in. And so he ended up accidentally doing an ultra marathon that day, which, I mean, just to be honest, how frustrating would that be? And the reason why I bring these, these ideas of being lost and directionless up is that it's not just when you're in the woods or when you're on an adventure that you need to have a sense of direction. That in life, it's equally important. This is what Andy Stanley says. He says, everybody ends up somewhere in life. A few people end up somewhere on purpose. That many people like James writes in James chapter one are kind of just being tossed to and fro by the waves of life. But few people have 
purpose and direction when it comes to their life. It reminds me of how we left off our text in 1 John chapter 2 last week. This is the final verse we read last week in 1 John chapter 2, verse 11. It says, But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And so this idea of light and darkness that John has been talking about, yes, it does mean you know, righteousness and unrighteousness, truth and lies, but also it has to do with purpose and direction. And what he's saying is the one who is living in darkness a, a sure tale sign of that is they really don't have good direction or purpose in their life. And maybe they do have goals. They, they're, they're climbing the ladder of success or financial security or any of those kinds of things. But ultimately, those directions won't get them where they want to go. Those things ultimately won't fulfill. And on the other side of that, those of us who are walking in the light we should not just live lives of righteousness and truth, but we should have a purpose and a direction in our lives. So here's the question I want to ask us today. Where are you going in life? Where are you going in life? Where do you want to be when you, you know, at the end of your days, where do you want to end up? And I think for us, there are two really important ingredients or factors into knowing where we're going and going somewhere on purpose. The first thing we need to know is we need to know our destination. We need to know our destination. Our destination for us as followers of Jesus is to walk in the way in which Jesus walked. It's to become like Jesus. It's to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do the kinds of things that Jesus did. And so that's really the goal, that life in God's kingdom means living as if Jesus is our king. So that's our destination. That's really ultimately where our lives should be headed. We, we live kingdom-centered lives, as Jesus says in Matthew 6, that we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So that's the destination. That's where we want to end up. But the other thing, the second thing we need to know if we want to get somewhere on purpose, is we need to know our current location. You need to know where you are. And if you know where you are and you know where you want to go, you can actually get your bearing and you can find a sense of direction. And so really the rest of our time today is going to be looking at where are you? Just taking a good, old-fashioned, honest look at where you are spiritually in life. Because you can't get where you're going if you don't know where you are. So let's jump into our teaching text from today, from 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So, You'll notice that if you've been listening or, or joining or reading through the letter of 1 John with us, that this section really stands out because it's highly structured. And the rest of 1 John doesn't seem to have a very rigid structure. It's more loose. It kind of, you know, is, is like a circular thought where someone circles back and they're talking about the same ideas. But here we see some pretty rigid structure. I want to point out, first of all, what John is doing in verses 12 through 14. So if you recall the last few weeks, John has been in this discussion of light and darkness, and it's been, to be honest, quite intense. Uh, John has been saying some really bold things or extreme things that maybe even might make us kind of question our own assurance or salvation, and that's really what we talked about last week. We talked about this idea of how do you know that you know God, but, but John has been saying things like, you know, if you're walking in the darkness, then you're a liar, you're, you're self-deceived. The truth of God is not in you. You know, he's, he's saying these really bold things. And it might lead us to kind of look at our own lives and kind of have a little bit of doubts. But I want to make this really clear because here the tone shifts. The tone shifts. It's not as instructional. And in fact, it's more just informative or encouraging what John is doing. His tone shifts, and he's writing to children and fathers and, and young men, and he's really saying these encouraging things, just truths about their faith. So today, there's not actually even a lot of instruction or, or commands or imperatives. It's mostly just encouragements for people in the church. And here's why that is, that what John is doing is, remember, there's false teachers, and there's people being deceived by those false teachers, and maybe they are believing a false gospel. What they have is what it, we can call false assurance. 
that they think they're saved, but they're not actually saved. They're actually walking in the darkness. And that's why I believe John is using this extreme language. And he's saying, you're lying, you're self-deceived, the truth of God is not in you. And so what John is trying to do is he's trying to take people who have false assurance and take that false assurance away so that they can find hope in the true gospel. But here we see the flip side of that. And the flip side of that is he's saying, if you do believe in, in the historical Jesus, if you have a faith in the genuine gospel of Jesus Christ, then he's really writing to assure you of your faith and to encourage you in your faith. And so today, I hope that today is encouraging. I hope that today builds you up in Christ. And then really the main question of today's passage is who are the children, the fathers, and the young men? Who are they? And, you know, scholars kind of arrive at different places. So I'll give you just two options, and I'll I'll say which option I think, you know, is preferred for me. The first most obvious option is that John is addressing literal children, fathers, and young men, you know. And so when he's writing to children, these are instructions to, to kids who are maybe seven years old or younger. When he's writing to fathers, these are, you know, male parents, you know, who have kids. And when he's writing to young men, those are people, you know, anywhere between 20 and 40 years old. And that's kind of like the most surface level idea, but I think it actually has a few main weaknesses. One of the main weaknesses is this idea that throughout the rest of the letter of 1 John, John refers to the whole church as his little children. And this is fair for John because he's at least 80 years old at the time of writing 1 John. He's done ministry. He was a pastor in Ephesus where we think that this letter was sent to. And so he has a pastoral relationship with people. And so even if there's people who are reading this letter who are in their 60s or 70s, John can call them children because he is their spiritual father. And so John doesn't use the phrase or the term children literally throughout the rest of the letter. So it doesn't seem supernatural to take that phrase literally here. Another weakness in this perspective that these are literal children, literal young men and literal adults, is this idea that what he says to each of those groups isn't exclusively to those kinds of people. So he writes to little children that their sins are forgiven and that that they know God. That's not just true of kids who are in Christ, that's true of the entire church. He writes to, to young men who have overcome the evil one, and they have strength in God's word. That's true of believers who have lived their life you know, in Christ. Also, that John has only used masculine nouns here. And so if we're going to take it literally, then he's probably you know, not speaking to any of the women in the church. He's only speaking to male children, male young adults, and, and male parents. And I don't think that's a great way to read this text at all. And so I think instead of literally, we should take this passage metaphorically that these aren't literal children, they're metaphorical children. And I think that these are categories, as the title of today's sermon suggests, of stages of maturity. Stages of maturity in Christ. This is what John Stott says. He says, he is indicating not their physical ages, as some have thought, but stages in their spiritual development. For, lot, for God's family, like every human family, has members of differing Maturity, and that's exactly what I would say as well, that there's these different categories of children or young adults or or parents when it comes to the faith. And that really kind of can include anyone in the church, anyone who's a follower of Jesus. And we do something similar. We have these different stages of discipleship. And so today, what I wanna do is I wanna break down our current stages of discipleship that we talk about all the time and show how the stages that John is talking about fit into our current framework. And really the important thing for you is to identify which stage are you in? Where are you at? Because you have to know where you're at if you wanna get where you're going. And for each of these different stages, after you identify where you're at, I'm gonna give you one thing that you need to know from the text. This, that's going to come straight from our text from 1 John chapter 2. And then I'm going to give you one way that you can grow. One way that you can know something, and then one way that you can grow and continue to go to the next stage of discipleship. So the first stage that John talks about is little children. This is a spiritual child, and it's someone for us in our framework, we would say these are the two different stages. We break this one stage into two. Someone who's either new or or young in the faith. So that's a spiritual child, is someone who is new or young in 
the faith. And so John is using this you know, metaphor of parenting, and we use the, meta- the plant metaphor. Both are scriptural. And if you don't believe me, check out 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul's speaking to the church in Corinth, and he says that they are like spiritual infants, and he had to feed them with milk because they weren't ready for kind of like the heavy stuff. And then just a few, verse later, a few verses later in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul writes and he says that he planted, Apollos watered, and God causes the growth. So if you think that we're mixing metaphors today, Paul did it first, okay? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul back-to-back uses this parenting metaphor for discipleship as well as a plant metaphor. And both of those metaphors are highly prevalent in the New Testament. So this is how you would know that you might be a spiritual child, that you might be new or young in the faith. You might have lack of experience. It might be that actually you haven't been a Christian for very long. It might be because you're just a little younger in years, or even if you're older in years, you might not have been a Christian for most of your life. And so you might be a spiritual child. There may be a lack of knowledge that you maybe haven't read through the Bible, that you you haven't read much scripture. You you don't have much of scripture committed to memory. Maybe your prayers uh, are a little bit one-dimensional instead of having kind of a holistic view of prayer. Mostly your prayers are just asking God for things. And certainly asking God for things is good, but there's more to prayer than that. And really the the main idea that, that designates someone who's a spiritual child or who's new or young in the faith is it's still mostly about them. That their, their walk with God is mostly about them. There's a lot of needs that have to be met. And so it could lead to something that we call, you know, spiritual consumerism. And sometimes that leads to a critical spirit where someone, you know, goes to a worship gathering or they listen to a teaching and they kind of are really critical about what, you know, the pastor said or how the, 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 the song sounded that day. Or it could just mean that there's just a lot of ne- needs for growth and there's just a lot of needs for some of that depth and that experience and that knowledge that only comes with time. So here's the thing for you to know, if that's you, if you're a spiritual child. Here's what you need to know. Your sins are truly forgiven and you know God. Your sins are truly forgiven and you know God. You see, if, if you are a spiritual child, as John is writing to you, uh, it might be easy to look at how much further you need to grow. And you might see like, man, I have a long way to go in my faith. But here's the good news for you, that your salvation is not dependent on your performance. Your salvation, the forgiveness of sins, as John talks about, it's dependent on his name's sake. And that means, yes, it is important. We've talked about this before, right? That confession's important, you know, humbling yourself, repenting, all of that is important. But salvation is based on not your performance or your work. Salvation is, is based wholly on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross in his death, burial, and resurrection. And so what that means is there's not going to be a Bible quiz when you go to heaven. You know, you're not going to be measured necessarily for your, the sake of your salvation on how deep you pray or how much you've given or how much you serve in your life. That, that here's what you need to know. You are truly forgiven and you know God. You have a relationship with God. So that's what you need to know right here, right now, today. But here's the second thing. The second thing is how should you grow? So here's your step for growth. Implement structure that supports growth. Implement structure that supports growth. Now, I understand that word structure isn't everyone's favorite word, but let me just phrase it like this. I had, uh, we did a garden this year, so we made a raised garden bed in our yard, and it was fun. You know, we had our daughter Lily help plant some of the plants. She, you know, ended up digging up some of the plants as well, but that's, you know, that's a whole nother deal, and we planted three tomato plants. You know, just little starters, just little tiny things, and all the other plants, except for the spinach, I guess, the spinach died, but all the other plants took off. They, they were doing great to this day. But the tomato plants instantly died. They all, you know, the leaves shriveled up, they dried out, and I, they died. And we were like, should we just dig these things up and plant new ones? But I kind of felt like we needed to just, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt and just see what would happen. So I, you know, I pruned all the dead leaves off, and it was just you know, three sticks in the ground is what it looked like, basically. And over a few weeks, though, I saw that the little buds started to form and little leaves started to sprout. And pretty soon, the, by the grace of God and his mercy, the tomato plants were covered. And it actually, we actually had the opposite problem, where one of the tomato plants got so big, it started doing what? If you've, if you've ever gardened, it started flopping over. 
and it became top heavy. And you know, the stock wasn't able to support all the growth that I had. So what did I do? I had to go to Home Depot and I had to get stuff to make a tomato cage. And I had to put structures in place around this tomato plant so that it could flourish and so that it could thrive. And so those rigid structures actually support the organic growth of the tomato plant. And the same thing is true in your spiritual walk. And for you, especially if you're younger in the faith, you need structure. Two different structures in particular. The first kind of structure is structure for the sake of spiritual practices. This is things like Bible reading, prayer, rest, generosity, just the things that God is calling you to. Different, you know, sometimes they're called spiritual disciplines, but just rhythms and practices for you to grow in your faith. One resource I would point you towards is it's, it's called a rule of life. It's kind of old language. It kind of grows out of you know, the, the monasteries where different monasteries would have a rule and kind of things that they would follow for the sake of spiritual formation. But really, it's that idea of a trellis. It's that idea of a tomato cage where there's structures that are a little bit more rigid, but they help you grow and flourish. And there's actually a church, King's Cross Church in London, that has a phenomenal online resource called pattern.org. UK. So it's over in the UK. So it's www.pattern.org.uk. And really this idea of pattern is patterning your life after Jesus. And they use a lot of similar language that we use. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what Jesus did. Uh, they talk about, you know, the P-R-A-Y acronym for pray. And what they have on their website is they have a rule of life generator where they'll just ask you, 10 different questions. And you know, you're supposed to pick a time each day when you're gonna read the Bible, a time each day when you're gonna pray. Uh, you know, how, you know, where are you gonna give your money to for the sake of generosity? Where are you gonna serve? What, you know, for your body, what are you gonna do to take care of your, your physical body? And it asks you these 10 questions, and then what it'll do is, you know, I, I did it this week actually, what it'll do is it'll actually generate um, a, little, a little picture for you, you know, scripture, prayer, mind, body, and it has your you know, what you've committed to for your rule of life. And you can save it to your phone. You can put it as a background on uh, your, your, your wallpaper or any of those sorts of things. And it's just a great, simple tool where, where you can text that to someone else and you can hold each other accountable. And it's just things that you're committing to. And so a rule of life is gonna change over time. But as it changed, you know, each season, you should kind of update it and change it. And, and that, those are some of the structures that you can put in place so that you can grow in your walk with Jesus. So that's the first one, is spiritual practices. But the second structure that's so vitally important is not just spiritual practices, which really you can do on your own, it's actually people. It's people to be in your life who can pour into you. And so this is why we really encourage people to get into life groups, you know, small groups where you're gonna discuss and pray and encourage and hold each other accountable. It might be, you know, a men's group or a women's group. It might be a Bible study that you go to. And even, you know, we're gonna hopefully talk about this more and more, this idea of mentorships, where maybe it's not what you think of with a typical small group of like 10 people. Maybe it's a micro small group with you and one other person or you and two other people. And it's, it's a small, small group. And you're meeting for coffee, you know, once a week. And really those are the relationships where you're not gonna just grow through watching teachings or participating in worship. You're going to grow when people are pouring into you. And so here's the most important question for you to be asking yourself. Who? Who is pouring into me? Who is pouring into me? If you're young in the faith, if you're new to the faith, you need to be able to answer that question with actual names. And it's not just enough to say, you know, Pastor Josh is pouring into me because I listen to his sermons. But who are the people who are actually in your life who are pouring into you? So those are the things you need to know, and those are the ways you need to grow if you are in the child stage of spiritual development. The next stage, though, is this idea of a spiritual young adult. A spiritual young adult. And, you know, the word in Greek that uh, John uses could actually be anyone, you know, from 20 to 40 years old. So adult, young adult, it's for us in our stages of discipleship what we would call growing faith. So spiritual young adult or growing faith. And some signifiers of this, is it someone who's really grown in experience? They've grown in knowledge. They've, they've grown in faith and, and depth. And maybe they've, they, they have a knowledge of the scripture. You know, their prayers have kind of expanded a little bit. They've started giving and serving. And, you know, they've benefited from a life group. They've been in different groups over periods of time. Uh, this is what real life ministries, how they, you know, talk about someone who's a spiritual young adult. They say, a spiritually young adult is the one who has moved from self-centeredness to God-centeredness. 
And so some of those you know, consumeristic attitudes of maybe someone who's younger in the faith or new to the faith have actually kind of fallen off, and now there's this God-centered, this, this mission-centered kind of life. So here's the thing for you to know. Here's what John wants you to know from the text. You have victory in Christ and strength from God's word. You have victory in Christ and strength from God's word. The, the, what John has said is he's saying, you've overcome the evil one. And you have strength that comes from the, God's word being rooted in you and in your life. And I want you to know that. I want you to be encouraged by that. If you've grown and you've matured in the faith, you have a growing faith, or you're a spiritual young adult, I want you to, to, to not just write off those victories, but to actually cling to those things. It's to know that there's actually been victory over sin in your life and to celebrate that victory and to be encouraged by that victory. At the same time, not to take the credit for that victory. Notice, where does your strength come from? John says your strength comes from God's word. And so the spiritual you know, development and formation that you've actually experienced has actually led to those kind of victories. It's not just your own willpower or your, your own goodness. It's the fact that you have victory in Christ that is giving you those victories in your life. So that's what John wants you to know. But here's how I think you need to grow. Here, here's your step of growth. Give what you have received. Give what you have received. See, you have had actual victory in your life. Maybe you've, you've overcome different sins and temptations. You've experienced reconciliation in relationships. You've even seen some victories in ministry and those sorts of things. Now it's time for you to start going from being a spiritual young adult to actually start pouring that out into someone else, caring for someone else. See, in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is speaking to you know, who we call the rich young rulers. And this rich young ruler is actually the same word in Greek that John uses for young men here. It's neoniskos. Neoniskos, and it refers to, you know, just someone who's between 20 and 40 years old. And this rich young ruler is, goes to Jesus, and he is a spiritual young adult in very, you know, very real sense. Jesus, you know, he asks him what he needs to do to, to have eternal life and, you know, to be a part of the God's kingdom. And Jesus says, well, you know, follow the commandments. He's like, I do follow the commandments. So, you know, he, he's read God's word. He has a knowledge of scripture. He's obedient to God's word. So, so he's not at this, you know, spiritual consumerism, but, but he, he's grown, he's matured. And then Jesus says, okay, well, come follow me. But here's before you can follow me, go sell all your possessions. And it's at that moment that the rich young ruler goes away sad because he's not willing to do so. He's not willing to give away what he's received and how he's been blessed. And I think for us, it's, it's so true that what God is calling you to do in your step of growth is to give away what you've received through faith, what I call faith-stretching opportunities. That's not just like dipping your toes in the water of ministry. That's not just like kind of giving. What, what Jesus is calling this rich young ruler to do is sacrificially give. Give in such a way that's faith-stretching. And certainly that does include you know, financially investing in the work of ministry. It includes serving, though. It also includes you know, how you reach out to others and how you share your faith with others. I would, in fact, say the most important thing that that means is you're giving away in the form of discipling someone else. You're, you're helping someone else experience the same victory and the same growth that you've experienced in Christ. And so I would ask you this in question. This is your most important question. Not who is pouring into you. Your most important question is who are you pouring into? Who are you pouring into? Who is it that maybe they're, they're, they're not at a place of faith that you're helping bring them to a place of faith? Who are those people who are younger in the faith and you're furthering them along? This might look like stepping up and starting to serve as leading a life group or asking someone if you can mentor them and pour into them. Those are the different ways that it, that it looks like to be someone who's a spiritual young adult who's making that shift and turning the corner to our next stage, which is being a spiritual parent. So a spiritual parent, the third stage that John talks about of maturity is someone who we would say is mature in the faith. They have a mature faith. And it's pretty obvious. A spiritual parent is someone who has spiritual children. And that means that, you know, there's someone who, who can point to the people and say, I've helped that person along in their faith. I've discipled that person. I baptized that person. And that's really what the goal is of maturing in Christ, that we would be reproducing disciples, that we would be people who are making more Disciples. So here's what you need to know if you are a spiritual parent. You have a knowledge of God that comes from experience. 
He, he actually says the same thing twice, and I wonder if it's because John doesn't have too much to say to those who are already mature in the faith. He says, you know him who is from the beginning, and even though you and your life have changed, God is unchanging, and you know the same God who is true yesterday, today, and forever, and maybe even your years of experience in the faith ha- have given you this depth of knowledge that really only comes from experience. It makes me think of this story about Charles Spurgeon. Just, he was called like the Prince of Preaching. He was a phenomenal preacher over in England in the 1800s. And he started preaching at a really young age. In fact, in his teenage years, Charles Spurgeon became you know, really kind of a phenomenal preacher and, and re- gained a lot of popularity. But in one of the sermons, when he was especially young, in his late teenage years, Charles Spurgeon gives this sermon on forgiveness. And at the end of the service, he asks his grandfather, you know, Grandpa Spurgeon, to come up and to be the one who prays to end the service. And I love what Grandpa Spurgeon says. He says, Charles can tell you about it, but I have lived it. Charles can tell you about it. He's a great preacher. He's smart, but I have lived it. I want to encourage you, if you're mature in the faith, you have years uh, of discipling people and pouring out into people. Once again, not necessarily even just years of church going, because you can go to church for years and years and years and still be young in the faith. But if you have years of you know, faithfulness to the gospel and doing the work of ministry, I want you to know that, that you have lived it that you've truly lived it, and you have this wealth and this richness of knowledge of God. So that's what what John wants to encourage you with, assure you with, and he wants you to know. But here's your way to grow. Your way to grow is this. Multiply by training and releasing disciples. Multiply by training and releasing disciples. See, your step of growth isn't to start pouring into people, because if you're a spiritual parent, you already are. Your step of growth is actually to send those people who you've poured into out. So we're not talking about maturity anymore. We're talking about multiplication. That's when you train people up and you release them to go and disciple others. See, Francis Chan talks about this in his book, Letters to the Church, specifically in the context of pastors. And pastors are are notoriously guilty for this idea of, you know, kind of having this savior complex where, you know, as long as they're gathering and accumulating people who are dependent on them, then they view that as the win. And that's really what what Francis Chan is going to talk about in this quote I'm going to show you. But we all know that the goal of parenting is not to raise kids who are adults and still heavily dependent on their parents. The goal of parenting is you would raise up your kids and then they would go out and that, you know, hopefully they would start families one day and that they would multiply and that you would have this, this idea where you have trained them up in the way that they should go and they would walk in it and they would be independent. This is what Francis Chan says in Letters to the Church. He says, churches are filled with children, spiritual children, who never grow up to become parents and they're not expected to. Many pastors expect their members to sit under their teachings till they die rather than training them to leave and shepherd others. And then later he asks these two questions. They're so important. While many pastors both of, boast of how many children sit under their care, doesn't it make more sense to boast of how many have graduated from their care? Isn't it more a sign of failure when children are unable to leave the house? And I think those questions are really fair for us to be wrestling with Today, this is why if there's a life group that has met together for years and years and years, we would just ask the question, who are you raising up and sending out? That there needs to be a training and a sending that happens. And so at the individual level, this means that you are meeting with someone, you're, you're maybe mentoring or you're caring for someone, and maybe it's even your own children or, or your spiritual children or whoever that is, but then they would one day be raised up in the faith and they would do that for someone else. That you've, you've made a disciple who is now making more disciples. That's what spiritual grandchildren at that point in time. Or it means life groups, that life groups are raising up apprentices and they're branching and our groups, we expect our groups to be starting more groups. And then ultimately at the, at the macro level, we believe that our church is called to one day plant another church. And that, so that means we're raising up leaders and, and we're going to be sending another church out. We don't have a hard plan, but we plan on making a plan and we really want to move towards church multiplication. So if you're a spiritual parent, here's the question for you. Who can you send out to pour into others? Who can you send out to pour into others? Maybe there's someone you've been pouring into for years and you're thinking about it and you're like, they're ready. They need to be commissioned by you. 
They need to be commissioned by you. That's one of the most important things you can do as a spiritual parent for someone. It's just to tell them what you see in them. Say, I see these, these great qualities in you. You should meet with that person. You should you know, step up into leadership. You should lead a life group. And you just lay a hand on them, pray for them, commission them, and watch how God uses them in even greater ways once you've released them for the sake of ministry. Well, there's one stage that we actually haven't covered, really because John doesn't cover it in his text today. But I want to touch on it because I think it's so important because there may be some of you watching this who fit into this stage of discipleship, and that's someone who's pre-faith. That's simply someone who does not yet have a faith in Jesus. And you might be in the pre-faith stage if you're really hostile towards Christianity, you're antagonistic, or maybe you're just skeptical or unsure, or, or you might even be seeking. You might be at the point today where you're on the verge of putting your faith in Jesus. I would ask you this same question we started with today. Where are you going in life? Where are you going in life? What's your, what's your end goal? What's your destination that you're trying to go to? And I would just call you to, to, to join us in the destination of walking towards becoming more like Jesus. Because all of those other destinations, whether it's career, success, security, you know, your physical health, all of those things are going to fade away. But it's truly that relationship with Jesus, living with him, that's going to last forever. And I was reminded by this, I was at a funeral this past week, and you know, funerals are, are really just you know, heartbreaking moments to reflect on the brevity of life and how we all must come to terms with that reality that we all will die one day. And the pastor who was preaching at the funeral, he brought up John chapter 14, and it really spoke to me about this idea. I was already thinking about this idea of where are you going and what direction are you going in life, and I just want to read to you. Jesus' words to his disciples, this is the night before Jesus you know, would go to the cross in John 14. He says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may also be. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, because it's not really super evident, he's being kind of cryptic. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I would just encourage you with those words of Jesus, that he is the only way to the Father, and he, here's what you need to know today. Here's, here's your no and your grow today. Your no is you need to know that Jesus made a way for you. I love that promise. He says, I'm going to the Father. I'm preparing a place for you. And that Jesus has prepared a place in his kingdom for you. And the way that Jesus has prepared the place is he's talking about how he's, he's going to the cross. He's gonna pave the way for salvation, pave the way for you to be made right with God by dying for the sins of the world, by dying for your sins on the cross and by raising back to life so that you can be raised up to a new life in him. So that's what you need to know today is that Jesus has died for you. He's raised back to life. That's the good news of the gospel. And then here's your step for growth. Accept the gospel by faith. Jesus says, believe in me. Believe in me. And, and that's really have faith in in me. And so believe the gospel, believe the words of Jesus and trust your life to him. And you can do that today by praying a prayer, asking Jesus to forgive your sin, and to lead your life. We would love to walk alongside you in that process. Uh, you could fill out one of our online connect cards. You can check the boxes for faith in Jesus or the box baptism. We would love to celebrate with you and, and we would love to walk alongside with you and answer any questions that you have. And we would love to help you take those steps of faith because we truly believe that that's where we want to go in life. We follow Jesus with everything because he first loved us.